Every morning, an army of hawkers move in, selling Buddha boy merchandise, including brochures, photo albums, and DVDs. We started selling these CDs a month ago when we were allowed to do so. Many of the sellers and pilgrims think he is the reincarnation of Buddha. His dream has been to gain Buddha's knowledge and spread the light of peace. The similarities are uncanny. Siddhartha, the Buddha, was born a mere 150 miles away to a mother with the same name, Maya Devi. Both chose to meditate for six years under the same type of tree and follow a life of abstinence. Buddha eventually found enlightenment through meditation, and that is what Ram is trying to achieve. You can see a light coming from the top of his head and sometimes from his forehead. Many of the stories that are circulating the site are probably just gossip, but they all feed the myth and the growing aura of the boy. One story that started the legend was that poisonous snakes bit him on two separate occasions. I saw him after the snake bite and he looked very pale. Cobras and vipers are common to the area and their bite is fatal. Incredibly, Ram required no medical attention from the bites. Because of his meditation, he flew, I mean, the, the poison. I heard about it. Some saw the blood, but no one saw the snake. He was sweating there, and with the sweating, his poison was born. Uh, the boy himself does seem to have uh, some spiritual powers. If we were beaten by a snake, we were already gone. Just because of his med pure meditation, He's alive. You know, you could question if, you're, uh, if you don't believe in these things, but the people seem to, his family seems to have faith in it, so we have to sort of recognize that. True or not, it is apparent that Ram Bonjan is putting himself in danger, not only by refusing sustenance, but also by sitting exposed to the elements and wildlife. This fatalistic attitude to death is very common in Asia. At this time, you know, he lacks calories, he lacks proteins, he lacks vitamins, and he lacks water. So he would be susceptible to illnesses. He's got no ability to maintain an immune response or to support an immune response, and it does increase his risk of dying from an acute infection. This lack of fear in dying is reflected in the way Nepalese conduct their funeral rituals. In the West, they're private, sad affairs. But there's openness here, an acceptance that sees death as a part of the cycle of life. Many put their bodies through extremes as they think it's their mission in life. There are many stories about these Rishimnis and uh, these great sages in the past. Some of them uh, could live without food and water for many years, not many months. In modern literature, Giri Bala, the non-eating saint, survived without food and water for 66 years, the longest time on record. Today, there are many that claim extreme fasting, from Pilot Baba, who survived underwater for five days without breathing, to Yog Mata, who buried herself alive for 72 hours. Even in Buddhist philosophy, there are people like that. Five hours into the second day of watching Ram, detained at the 25-meter fence, a chance arises to try and find some answers to this extreme fasting phenomenon. Lama Lekshi, Grand Master from India, runs several monasteries around the world. It was at one of these that Ram was taught meditation. The Lama has come to check on his pupil and allows us to follow him into the inner sanctum. The boy uh, belongs to uh, Kiku Buddhist monastery, which is in India, in Himachal Pradesh. And that monastery belongs to the Sakya tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. Very little is known of Sakya, one of the four Buddhist traditions. Its leaders keep their teachings a closely guarded secret. Buddha's teaching or our practice is not for your fame, not for your reputation, not to collect so many disciples. We usually don't expose much. We have another meditator. He has been doing this for the last 30 years. Today, his hair is so long that he can't stretch down, so he put the sm small back hanged up behind and then put all the hairs into that.
To endure solitary existence in extreme conditions, yogic techniques enable you to focus your mind over your body's suffering. Obviously, if he's genuine, uh, has to use some yogic techniques like feeding on the air, feeding on the breath. Uh, there are other techniques where you use a uh, stone, okay, a little stone that you put in your mouth and you feed on the stone. There are all those stories. They are documented in the literature, in the Buddhist literature. To understand what type of yogic technique Ram is practicing from the Sakya tradition of teaching, the Lama sits and stares at the boy. I'm amazed by this, uh, by this immense, uh, it, the intensity of his determination. He, he told his mother that he was going to sit there for six years and reach Buddhahood, you know, which is very rare. I mean, nobody says that, you know. They sit facing each other for more than an hour in what seems to turn into a meditation duel. Sweat starts to form on Ram's face despite a lack of movement and an air temperature of only 15 degrees centigrade. To suddenly start pouring sweat from the face is a very strange phenomenon. He's managing to control his body's physiological process, which no one has demonstrated before. It's not something you ever see in Western society. Um, so how that's being controlled is, is beyond my level of knowledge. When he was sitting down, I was doing my meditation. Actually, I was competing. And you know that the sweat came down. Okay, so why, why did you sweat? Uh, no, it's a secret thing I don't want to tell you right now. In ancient Buddhist texts, it is written there is a yogic technique called tumo, which increases the body's temperature under intensive meditation. Sweating is a side effect. The question is a young boy like that, you know, how he has mastered these kind of techniques. Obviously, he has not practiced long time in caves or in solitude or in a monastery. So it's very rare, especially nowadays, to hear that somebody is doing it in front of everybody like that. I mean, totally live. To understand how Ram learned the practice of Jumo and continues to survive without food and water, we must look into his past and his first visit to Lumbini, the birthplace of Buddha. These places are the power point. If you step here with with faith, devotion, and with the mindfulness, definitely that energy will, will, will do something for your brain and as your, your physical body. Uh, definitely uh, a boy like that, you know, who is so much devoted and sitting for almost like seven, eight months you know, meditating in a, in a jungle, you know, when he does this ground, definitely I believe he was very much inspired, maybe got some power. That, that, that's, that's possible. After Lumbini, Ram chose to study at a secret Tibetan monastery near Dehradun, India, 10,000 feet up in the Himalayan mountains and cut off from civilization. There are many examples of monks practicing tumo intensive meditation in the hills nearby. Ram sort of uh, gravitate toward this monastery, and at that moment, I think it was 2002, I think, or 2003, that he came. It's sort of like his own recognition. And but he's too different. He's too different. Why is he too different? There's a, so it's something to like so different to the other monks. Too much. A particular form of Tibet meditation where the exponents are capable of withstanding extremely harsh conditions with very little food, very little water, and very little clothing. Some lamas are doing meditation in the icy Himalaya. Uh, from their body, they bring the heat. So, same way, maybe he has done that. American scientists tested the theory in 1982. Monks were soaked in sheets of cold water.